Diana had this question. Um, hi, Tanika. I was wondering the reasoning on why they had you do this test for your IVF cycle. Thanks for clicking on Simply Tanika. I am Tanika. If you are new here, welcome. Hit that subscribe button. Let's hang out a while. If you are returning, welcome back. What's up, fertility fam? We gotta do what? Let's get those babies, ladies. What's up, fertility fam? How are you? Today is Monday, it's July, it's the 15th. Half the month is gone. Um, I wanted to come on and respond. I'm coming to you earlier than normal this week because Diana had a question. I posted my glucose tolerance test uh, and results on Friday and Diana had this question. Um, Hi Tanika, I was wondering the reasoning on why they had you do this test for your IVF cycle. And I posted a note, I did respond to you Diana, but I wanted to, in case other people had the same question and I wanted to elaborate. I touched on it a little bit in the video where I went over my test results. So basically there are three reasons why my doctor um, had me do the glucose tolerance testing before the IVF. So one is I only have one kidney. I gave the other one to my sister. So the way that my body is processing glucose is different um, than the way someone with two kidneys um, their body would process it, right? So it's between your kidney and your liver. Um, it's processed. So one, just to make sure that there were no sort of red flags about the functioning of my kidney. Um, it has performed well. I got tested last year, I think in September, so I don't need to be tested again. Um, it's an annual test until next September. So it functions fine. The idea is that it takes the place of both the kidneys and so far my body has done that, but there's always the added risk that one year it might not or it might begin to deteriorate. As you know, pregnancy has a great strain on the body as you bring forth new life. And so it's just due diligence um, to make sure that my kidneys, one singular kidney and liver are working well. Um, so that was the first reason. Second one is I am being prescribed um, as part of my stims, Omnitrope, which is a human growth hormone. And so your body, our bodies, um, respond to this human, this additional, we all have human growth. Uh, we all have growth hormone. It's ours, so it's human. Um, it responds differently when we are prescribed this. And if you are not processing glucose um, properly, it's, it's a waste of time and money to have you do the Omnitrope or any other um, HGH. There are different brand names for it. I think the can't remember what the there's a generic name for it. I'll put it here what the generic name is because there are multiple brands but the one that I'm using happens to be Omnitrope but I want to read a little bit off of this site that I found and I'll put the links um, in the description box below but here we go this is from the NCBI website which is where I get a lot of my um, research data which NCBI stands for, I'll put it down below. I'm looking down on my phone if you're wondering. Okay, I'm just gonna read this summary again. I'll put the whole article down below, but GH therapy antagonizes insulin's action on peripheral tissues such as the skeletal muscle, liver, and adipose tissue, thereby increases glucose production from the skeletal muscle and liver and decreases glucose uptake from adipose tissue. Insulin production is increased to compensate the increased circulating glucose after GH administration. DH, GH induced uh, lipolysis in the visceral adipose tissue and subsequent increased circulating FFA also interferes with insulin signaling pathways and chronic exposure to high FFA may exert direct toxicity in beta cells. So that's a mouthful, I know. But it's all to say that basically the GH is going to increase um, the glucose that is being released in my body. So um, it would be irresponsible for them to give me GH and not know how my body was responding to glucose, how well my body tolerated the glucose. Um, because 
it is going to be increased. And so either my body's going to process it or it's going to struggle processing it. And so that was another reason to take, um, for taking the tolerance test. And then the last one, um, there are studies that indicate abnormal preconception oral glucose tolerance test predicts an unfavorable pregnancy outcome after an in vitro um, fertilization cycle. And this is from um, Ferility and Sterility website, which I'll also link it below. But basically, um, they conducted a study. They looked at women who had abnormal pre-pregnancy um, glucose rates and it was noted that their um, pregnancies either were preterm or did not continue fully. So that's another reason to test um, before you have your IVF cycle. I just want to look at the numbers. Um, so, and they're defining preterm as patients who delivered before 37 weeks. They were designated as having a preterm birth. Um, so I just want to give you the criteria. And they um, are classing anyone who had two or more of their um, glucose values were abnormal. Either at fasting um, one or two hours um, after glucose administration. So pregnancy-induced hypertension was defined as maternal... Um, defined as maternal diastolic blood pressure uh, greater than or equal to 90 mmHg during pregnancy on two consecutive readings taken four hours apart. So there was also an incidence of um, hypertension. Okay, so in vitro cycle protocol, it kind of goes over, I'll put the link in here, but basically, let me just go to the results. 120 of 280 first IVF cycle patients achieved pregnancy for a pregnancy rate of 42.9%. There were 23 pregnancy losses, which equals 19%. Uh, there was no stati statistical differences in age, BMI, waist to hip ratio. Um, it's a clinical study, so we have to be that specific. Uh, FSH, LH, T, fasting glucose and insulin, two-hour glucose and two-hour insulin levels, and the homostatic model assessment of insulin resistance between the pregnancy and non-pregnancy groups or between the pregnancy loss and ongoing pregnancy groups. The pregnancy group with complications was significantly older, weighed more, and had higher fasting glucose levels than did the normal full-term pregnancy group. Um, BMI was higher. Uh, however, after adjustment for age and BMI, fasting glucose levels were not statistically different. For the non-pregnancy group, 15 patients had biochemical pregnancies, what we call chemical pregnancies, and 145 patients had a negative HCG. In the biochemical group with pregnancy losses, the LH and two-hour insulin levels were statistically higher than those in the patients with a negative HCG. Um, among the 25 patients who had pregnancy complications, there was one patient who had both GDM and a preterm delivery. Um, and one other patient who had GDM, pregnancy-induced hypertension, and a preterm birth. When we compare the 11 preterm patients with the 64 full-term pregnancy patients, the preterm group had statistically higher BMI, levels of fasting glucose, and insulin, and uh, uh, two-hour glucose. Um, so there's a, it's very wordy. I'm not going to read it all in this um, video, but I will link it below for those of you guys who are interested. It's double-sided, six pages, where it goes on about the study and what the differences are. So it would be an indication um, that I would not fare well in pregnancy if I had a glucose level that was too high. I wanted, I was looking for the ranges because they gave like a range. At any rate, the numbers that I have were well below uh, average, so I'm not at risk for being on the high side. But it is an interesting study, so if you, you know, if you like studies and science and research, I definitely recommend that you check it out. But yeah, so hopefully that answers your questions. Um, let me just see if I can find this really quickly.
uh, I can but I do want to say this because I don't want to have um, I don't want to scare anyone and again all the data there's a lot of it so definitely don't just run with what I'm quoting I'm quoting this to support what I'm saying but for you to get a fully you know a well-rounded picture definitely read it for yourself but I will say this because I'm not trying to scare anyone insulin resistance was not associated with all of the pregnancy complications that were observed in our patients however patients with preterm births had higher BMI fasting glucose fasting insulin and two-hour glucose levels and had a higher the HOMA IR the HOMA IR um, than did the normal full-term patients and the HOMA is we just said it but in case you're not putting it all together. Sorry guys, I should have highlighted this before I started talking. That would have made it easier. Homostatic model assessment of insulin resistance is the HOMA. Homostatic model assessment, so that's the HOMA. And then IR is the insulin resistance. So those were higher, but they were not attributable to all of the, or all of the, um, abnormalities with the pregnancy were not attributable just to those things so I just I'm, I don't want to scare anyone because sometimes you have gestational diabetes um, and it's not indicative of um, you'll have these complications that are listed here some people have it doctors normally monitor you really well and you're fine um, and then you're back to normal after you have the baby so I don't want to scare anyone but I do I did want to answer the question about why I had a two-hour glucose fasting test before I started my meds. So hopefully that answered your question. If you have any other questions, comments, concerns, leave them down below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And um, yeah, I'll see you later this week. Bye. Mwah. Baby does to us all.